almost never true, even for particular axes. So anyway, don't do that. When you have an absolute value, get rid of the absolute value. That's the first thing to do. You integrate in the negative interval and then on the positive interval, and you get your antiderivatives, which are going to be different, of course, on each sub-interval. So uh, that was one thing. The other thing uh, that you didn't need, actually, in a problem, what problem was it? Problem. Uh, Problem eight. In problem eight, many of you say uh, f is integrable, so I can find x zero and x one, so that uh, f of x zero is the lower and uh, f of x one is the upper thing. Well, what you're doing is using the extreme value theorem. But you cannot do that for integrable functions. Your function must be continuous. OK? And you didn't need it. And then you forget about it, and you, you go on to do the right computation. But you still lost some point, because this was a bad mistake again. OK? So be careful. The extreme value theorem, you need f to be continuous. The integrable functions are not regular enough to, to ensure this. And what was uh, the other mistake? Yeah, about 10, 10b. Many, many people. Uh, so you, you want to show that the product of two integrable functions is integrable. Well, that's what you're trying to prove, so don't use this result. I mean, many people say, well, of course I know the product of two integrable functions is integrable. That's not a good reason, OK? You need to prove it. Now, uh, many of you thought of using A, of course, but then you need to justify why f plus g of square is integrable. And again, you were kind of sloppy, many of you. It was like uh, by operations on integrable functions. That's kind of vague or by composition of integrable functions. That's a wrong statement. You may find examples of two integrable functions. When you compose them, you don't find something integrable. So that's not a true theorem. The true theorem is the one I stated, which was if my external function is continuous and the internal function is uh, integrable, then you get something integrable. Okay, that's the, the theorem you needed to use. And the continuous function is the square function. Of course, this is continuous. And the integrable function is inside. You know it's integrable because we did see that the sum of two integrable functions is integrable. Okay? So be more careful when you use theorems. Check your hypothesis. Make sure your arguments make sense. OK, so uh, today I wanted to go on with uh, topics from chapter 4. Uh, so this is really more uh, some, uh, let's say, mathematical culture that you need to, to have when you know, you're a math major. I think you need to, to know some of this stuff. And, uh, so last time what we did was Wallis products and Wallis integrals. And so what I'd like to, to do today is still in 4.2. and uses uh, Wallis integrals. And it's about uh, one of uh, Euler's formula. That states that the series 1 over k squared from k equal 1 to infinity is pi squared over 6. OK, so. This is a, a, 
a nice result that uh, uh, is not as you are going to see you need you need to do something to to prove it and uh, there are several methods but really the quickest way to do things like that is uh, by using complex uh, variables and uh, this will come out of uh, uh, a well-chosen integral, complex integral, uh, rather easily, but it's based on big terms. Here we are going to do things more or less by hand, so in some sense it's less mysterious. You see better from where these things come. Uh, so let's uh, let's start with the following. We are going to have a power series, use a power series expansion for the inverse function of sine, which is arc sine of x, and that's going to be uh, x plus the series x to k plus 1 over 2k plus 1. So re remember, uh, not long ago, we found the power series expansion of arc tangent. And that was rather easy. You, you start with a geometric, with actually the algebraic uh, identity, xn minus yn, if you factor that. And by uh, integrating, you find a formula. Arc sinus is more difficult to get. It's more difficult to get because you, you cannot use the geometric series and you need to uh, use the so-called uh, binomial uh, series, the expansion. For those of you who are interested, uh, there is a proof of that in section 4.1. Uh, so it's, it's a series of applications. Uh, the binomial series is really proved in 4.1, uh, let's see, where is it? Yeah, page 119. And uh, it's, it's not uh, difficult, but you have quite a few computations, and you use differential equations to, to do it. That's one way to do it. Anyway, so you end up with a formula like this for our signs, fine. Now, what the first step in, in this proof is to do a substitution to say, okay, I'm going to do x equals sinus t. And so what is arc sinus of sinus t? What's this equal to? t, of course, because these are two inverse functions. And now let's plug sinus t in here. So we are going to get that t is uh, sinus t plus this thing here. So we get this. Now note that uh, the problem with doing that is that uh, we lost our power series in the sense that this is no longer a power series in t, okay? Because now I have sinus t in it. A power series in t would be t to a power something, no, no other thing. So it's a more complicated object. Uh, in order to, to make appear uh, the series we want, we are going to take integrals. So we're going to take integrals across, and we're going to integrate this thing from 0 to pi over 2. So we are going to say that the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of t dt is the integral of sinus t dt plus the integral 
of the series that we have there. And of course, uh, this piece is fine. Okay, that's half of t square to be taken between 0 and pi over 2. And this is minus cosine t to be taken between 0 and pi over 2. And the, the big problem is this thing here. We're doing the, the integral of a series of functions. And what's tempting is to say, well, this is actually the series of the integrals. Okay? What we'd like is to interchange the, the, the sum and the integral. The problem is that I have an infinite sum. So we know that the integral is linear. Okay? If you give me 100 functions uh, that I sum, I can say, OK, the, the integral of the sum of the 100 functions is the sum of the 100 integrals. No problem. The problem here is that this is a very convenient notation, but it's misleading because it gives you the impression that you are doing a sum. You're not. What you're doing is a limit of the sum. Okay, so you have a limit here. And uh, what you are really asking is, can I in interchange a limit with my integral? So can I pull my limit outside the integral? That's what you're asking. And the answer is, in general is no, you cannot. Uh, however, in cases like that, you can, uh, and that's one of the objectives of the next course, 532. You will you will learn theorems that allow you to to that will give you uh, necessary conditions, or at least sufficient conditions rather, uh, to be able to do that. So you do you look at your series of functions and if you know convergence is nice enough and i'm not going to get into that you you would look at different types of convergence then you can interchange okay so you have to take my word here and uh, say to and believe me that yeah in this case you can do it and you can write this as being a, a, a sum a series of intervals so we go ahead and uh, we do it. So we copy the coefficient, which is 2k factorial over 2 to the k factorial k. And then uh, 1 over 2k plus 1 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sinus t to the power 2k plus 1 dt. Okay, so we just say, well, the, the integral of a series is the series of integrals. Now, this is our new friend, uh, Wallis integral, i to k plus 1. Okay, remember from last time, that's the definition of the Wallis integral. So we have a formula for that. So the formula is what? Uh, here it is, i to k plus 1 is, and there is a, no, there is no type of one timing, okay. But i to k plus 1 is uh, 2, so all the even numbers up to 2k over uh, all the odd numbers up to 2k plus 1. And let's, let's simplify a little bit the notation by using factorials. So when we have 2, 4, uh, 2k, uh, you see that uh, you have k even numbers. So we can factor out 2 k times. So we would get 2 to the k, and then what's left is 1, 2, 
3 all numbers to k. So this is really when you are multiplying from 2 to 2k, you are really getting 2 to the k times factorial k. You see it? Okay, you are just factoring out the 2 to the k. Okay, and now, so that, that takes care of my numerator. Okay, to get an isoformula. Now let's take care of uh, the denominator here. We do 3, 5 over 8 to 2k plus 1. Well, here I'm missing numbers to get factorials. So let's multiply by all the even, because uh, that, these are the numbers that I'm missing. So let's do, let's say that this is 2 times 3 times 4 over 8 to 2k times 2k plus 1. And then we need to divide by all the even numbers, which are 2, 4, over way to 2k. Okay, so I multiplied and I divided by the product of even numbers from 2 to 2k. This is factorial 2k plus 1. And this is 2 to the k factorial k. Okay, because that's the formula we just saw here. So we get this. Now, uh, our Wallis integral then becomes 2 to the k factorial k uh, over this guy here, which is 2 to the k plus 1 factorial over 2 to the k factorial k. So we end up with 2 to the k factorial k squared over 2k plus 1 factorial. OK, so it's a more compact uh, way to write things, that's all. OK, so uh, we need to continue our computation here. So this thing is 1 half of pi over 2 to the square minus 0. Uh, this is 0 for pi over 2 plus 1 plus k equal 1 to infinity factorial 2k, 2 to the 2k factorial k square, 1 over 2k plus 1 times this guy here, and this guy is this. So let's use this. So let's write it as 2 to the 2k factorial k to the square over factorial 2k plus 1. So we have some nice simplifications, 2 to the 2k, 2 to the 2k cancel, factorial k and factorial k square cancel. And uh, so let's see the other cancellation we have. is, uh, so what can I say about factorial 2k over factorial 2k plus 1? One over 2k plus 1. Okay, so I can use this here. And I have another 2k plus 1. So at, uh, at the moment, what we have is a pi square over 4, uh, half of pi square over 4, that's pi square over 8 equal to 1 plus the series from k equal 1 to infinity of 1 over 2k plus 1 squared. <coughs> That's almost the promised uh, formula. Not quite. I mean, instead of having all the 1 over k squared, I have only 1 over the even ones. Questions uh, up to this point? We're almost done because once we have this one, we have we have a thing. Uh, we, we have others from. 
And that's because, uh, yeah, we, if we look at one over two squares, so, so the terms that are missing are the 2k squared. These are the ones that are missing in my series here to have all of them. So we, uh, you see that you get one fourth of the series one over k squared. And uh, so how can we write this? Well, we. So now we are going to write that the series 1 over k squared is the series of the even plus the series of the odd. Okay, we, we split in two and we we have in the first series the even ones and in the second one the odd ones and this according to what we just said is one fourth of <coughs> this and this guy we computed is pi square over 8 minus 1 Now, we put this series on this side and we get 3 fourths of the series of 1 over k squared and times pi squared. Hmm. So what's this minus 1? Let's see. Okay. Okay. So um, here there is something missing. You see, uh, for k equal one, I'm starting at two here. It's my first term is one over two to the square, and here my first term is one over three to the square. So I'm missing the first term, which is one. Okay, if I want the all the terms, I should have 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared. So this series and this one take care of all the terms except for the very first one, which is missing. So I need to put a plus 1 here. And uh, so we get pi squared over 8 here because minus 1 cancels with plus 1. And finally, the series k from k equal 1 to infinity of 1 over k squared is 4 thirds of pi squared 8, which is pi squared over 6. So we, we do get uh, Euler's formula by doing this manipulation. Questions? Okay, the following topic I'd like to talk about is the uh, Stirling's formula. And Stirling's formula tells you that the limit as n goes to infinity of factorial n over square root of 2 pi exponential minus n n to the power n plus one half, this is what? So you may think this is great, like uh, what am I going to do with that? It's actually very useful because factorial n is difficult to compute because it goes so fast and uh, it's very useful to have an estimate. 
Now, let's, before we, we talk about the proof, and we are not going to prove the whole thing because it's a little involved, uh, let's, let's think about factorial n. What we, we do is we multiply over numbers from 1 to n. That's what factorial n is. Each one of these guys is less than n. Actually, except for the first one, the other ones are strictly less than n. So they are all less than n, and uh, there are n of them. So I am, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, this quantity is strictly less than n to the n. Okay, because I'm replacing. If I replace each factor by n, I get n to the n. But they are all less, except for the first one. They are all strictly less than n. So I must get an upper bound by doing that. And it looks like it's uh, grossly overshot. I mean, because you are replacing all numbers by n, and uh, but. It turns out what Stirling's formula tells us is that, yes, it's an overshot, but not that bad, actually. Because if I multiply by exponential minus n, then I get more or less the correct uh, estimate for factorial n. Okay, this is what this is telling me. And, and that's uh, very useful to know that, to know that uh, uh, your factorial n be behaves like that. So how do you go to prove something like this? Uh, the, the main difficulty is really to get your constant right. And that we will not do because it's uh, too much work. But uh, as you're going to see, to get more or less the, the, the order of magnitude is not so bad, actually. So let's do that. And let's work with logs. So, uh, so log of factorial n is the sum of ln of k. Okay, because since uh, uh, factorial n is a product, the log of a product is the sum of logs. So we have this. Now, uh, what? we are going to do. And what you should note in these applications is how integrals are useful. Okay? We use the integrals to, to get our formula for the, for the series 1 over k square. Now we are going to use integrals again to estimate uh, sums like this. So how do we do that? Well, we first thing we say that ln of x is less than ln of k for all for x in uh, k minus 1k. What am I using when I'm saying that? That ln of x is less than ln of k. Log is an increasing function, yes. Very slowly increasing, but but increasing. So you take your interval k minus one k, and you get that everybody in here is less than ln of k. You are not doing anything really mysterious. Now, if this is true, we can integrate between k minus one and k. So we integrate between k minus 1 and k ln of x. And that's going to be less than integral from k to k minus uh, from k minus 1 to k of ln of k dx. Let's use the fundamental theorem of calculus for this. But in order to do that, I, know, I need to remember from calculus what an antiderivative for an of, of x is. So do you remember that? No, that's the derivative. How do I get an, an of x? 
Well, if I do x ln of x minus x, I get ln of x because I do a product term here, which is ln of x plus x 1 over x minus 1. So we get ln of x uh, when we take the derivative of x ln of x minus x. So we do that. And on this side, this is a constant. It's ln of k. And so we have the integral of 1 between k minus 1 and k. That's 1. Okay, so we get ln of k here. So, and here we get k ln of k minus k minus k minus 1 ln of k minus 1 minus k minus 1 for this side here. Uh, then I get a plus here. So I should write it. So we're doing x ln of x minus x between k minus 1 and k. That's what this is. So let's uh, arrange this a little bit. Actually, uh, we are going to use this, but we are we need first to sum this. Okay, so uh, we are not going to do this right now, but at the end, actually. Okay, so uh, let's okay, so let's go back to this inequality here. So k minus one to k ln of x dx is less than ln of k. Okay, so I took the integrals and I computed this side, which is ln of k. And now let's do the sum from k equal to to n of the, of both sides. Now, when I'm summing these integrals, I'm starting at 1. It goes from 1 to 2. And then the following one, see what this is, is the integral from 1 to 2 plus the integral from 2 to 3 plus over way from n minus 1 to n. So when I sum the, these n integrals, what do I get in the end? One to n. So I get from 1 to n, ln of x dx. And that's smaller than ln of k. can do the other side. Uh, now we can compute this using the formula which was there. And that's what we get for this side. And that is less than the series 
ln of k from k equal uh, is it 2 to n. It doesn't matter whether you start at 2 or at 1 here because ln of 1 is 0. So you don't, that's not really a problem. Okay. So you get an upper bound, a lower bound by doing that for your sum ln of k. And you get Uh, so you can do uh, a symmetric thing by just saying that so to get an upper bound you get what? Uh, you use that ln of k is less than ln of x for x in k, k plus 1. So same thing, this time you change your, your interval, you, you take the left hand, uh, the left bound of your interval and you get this. And you do exactly the same thing, you integrate from k to k plus 1 and you get L of x dx then you sum over all k from 1 to n minus 1, k, k plus 1, n of x dx, and that's less than shouldn't do that. Let's, let's first say that, so this is the constant, I pull it out and I integrate 1 between k and k plus 1. So that would be uh, just ln of k. So we should write this like this. Sum of ln of k from k equal 1 to n minus 1 is less than the sum from k equal 1 to n minus 1 of the integrals again you, you sum your integrals so you get the sum from 1 to n of ln of x dx and that's x ln of x minus x to be taken between 1 and n And we get n ln of n minus n minus uh, 1 ln of 1, that's 0, plus 1. That's what we get for this. So uh, now we can summarize our two bounds by saying that the sum Okay, so how do I get this? I did get, okay. Uh, okay, so here I have a sum from 1 to n minus 1, and I want to compare it to the sum from 1 to n, which, uh, where is it, which is here. So what I'm going to do is simply say that the sum from k equal 1 to n of ln of k is less than the sum, what I, I just wrote here, plus the term which is missing, which is log of n. 
So we get n plus 1 ln of n minus n plus 1 when we do that. So now we can squeeze our ln of k from k equal 1 to n and say that it's bigger than uh, this thing here and ln of n minus n plus 1 and smaller than n plus 1 ln of n minus n plus 1. Okay, that's the double uh, bound that we get. So now, what does this tell us about factorial n? I mean, uh, how do I get my factorial n back? Well, I'm going to take exponentials on every side, and I'll get my, uh, my factorial n back. So we need to take exponential is an increasing function, so the inequalities are not going to change. And what happens when I do exponential of n ln of n minus n plus 1? Well, I get exponential of ln of n to the n times exponential minus n times uh, plus 1. Which is, so this guy here becomes n to the n exponential minus n plus 1. Okay? Uh, what happens to exponential of log of k when I do the exponential of the sum? Well, this is exponential of ln of factorial n, so we get factorial n, of course. And then we do exponential of this guy here. minus n plus 1. Well, that's going to be n plus n to the power n plus 1 times exponential minus n plus 1. So we get factorial n between two bounds. Uh, the, it's bigger than the first one, and n exponential minus n plus 1. And it's smaller than n to the power n plus 1 exponential minus n plus 1. So, and what's nice about this is that the two bounds are kind of similar. I mean, there is not that much room between them, okay? And so that's why you may think, well, actually, by refining the method, I should be able to find the exact growth. And the exact growth, again, is what? It's n, factorial n turns out to be n to the n, exponential minus n, n to the half, times a constant. So you see we are not that far. And unlike it might seem to you, we have done very little work up to now. Okay? Because what we have done is just say log is an increasing function. I'm comparing log of k to log of x between k and k plus 1. I'm summing things and using antiderivative, a fundamental theorem of calculus. So it's not like, you know, we have killed ourselves yet uh, to get this. So it's kind of a nice result just by using the, the fundamental theorem. Now, if you want to go further on, then I'll let you go along because it's uh, more, uh, it's a lot more work, but again, each step is not that bad. The problem is that you need many steps to, to do it. So you have two things to do. You first need to show that actually you can get uh, basically the two sides to be the same asymptotically because you want the ratio to go to 1. And second thing, you need to find the C. And the C involves Wallis integrals. Okay, that's one nice way to compute the C. It's square root of 2 pi.
so I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, look at it if you feel like. But it turns out that this form is very important in a number of uh, different subjects. And you see how uh, uh, pi appears in so many formulas in, in mathematics and physics. Uh, here you get your square root of 2 pi appearing. And a priori, I mean, it's kind of surprising because factor n has very little to do with pi. You, you are just multiplying naturals, and you, you still get uh, that pi uh, appears in, uh, in its estimate. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. Okay, uh, just let me uh, mention a little bit of 4.3, which is uh, infinite products. And so consider the following problem. Um, define Qn to be 1 plus u1 times 1 plus u2 plus times 1 plus u where the ui are numbers that are positive or zero. Okay, so you have a sequence u of positive numbers, and you look at the product 1 plus u1 times 1 plus u2 over way to 1 plus un. And then you ask yourself what qn does. Now, what happens when I have numbers bigger than 1? I mean, uh, let's say that uh, all my ui are all equal to 1. What would the qn look like? It would be 2 to the n. Does 2 to the n converge? No. So what do you think it's possible to pick positive uis so that this product converges as n goes to infinity. So you keep multiplying by numbers that are strictly bigger than 1. So you are getting something which is bigger and bigger. Can, can this be bounded, or is this just going to blow up like 2 to the n? That would be a possibility, okay? You take your UIs to be 0 after a while, so you're multiplying by 1, and you're fine. But that's a, a coward approach. Let's take UI strictly positive. It must converge to 0, certainly. But the, the thing is that the result, the nice result about this is the following, that QN converges if and only if the series ui converges. So not only your ui must go to 0, but it must go to 0 fast. Because if it doesn't go to 0 fast enough, then your series doesn't converge. So that's, that's something that people you know, uh, don't really 
thing about uh, infinite products, it's uh, not something that you see in calculus, for instance, usually, but it's, it comes up in a number of uh, different applications, and it is uh, sometimes misleading because you think, well, all these numbers are bigger than one, I'm going to have something unbounded. No, not true, because they are bigger than one, but they may be approaching one very fast. If you make them approach one very fast, then it's like essentially multiplying by one after a while. And you get your infinite product to converge. And the right condition is this condition here. So in particular, you need, uh, you need, U, you need ui to go to zero. So for instance, What do you think of this product? Do you think this, this has a limit? It doesn't, no limit, because the series one over n diverges. So even though you are adding things that go to zero, they don't go to zero fast enough. And this thing is going to explode, okay? It's going to become unknown. Now, if you do the same problem with the square, this time it converges since the series 1 over n square converges. Okay? And this time you, you notice that you are adding things that are smaller and smaller. I mean, that goes to zero much faster than these ones. And so, of course, the, the threshold is a power of one. Strictly bigger than one will give you convergence. Uh, less or equal to one will give you divergence. Okay? Yeah, so uh, the point here is to give you some uh, idea of how you can apply these ideas of, anal of analysis, how you, you use uh, series, integrals, and so on to uh, answer some uh, concrete <coughs> question like this one. Okay. Questions? So on Thursday, we'll uh, review. Okay, have a look at uh, uh, what I gave you to, to look at. And um, that will be our last uh, class. And final is on Tuesday, December 12th. And I'm not sure of the time. Does anyone know? At 10.50. 10.50, OK. So final is? So it will be for 2 hours and 30 minutes. It probably will be slightly longer than uh, uh, the test, but not much longer. So you should not need to use it, to use the, the whole 2 hours and 30 minutes. But you, you are free to use it, of course. Yeah.